Hello and welcome. This is Crypto Chain with the very first episode of a Simple Cryptocurrency Webcast. And today I've got a special guest with me. His name is Forrest and he goes by the YouTube channel of Hashoshi and he's actually an Ethereum developer. So this is going to be a very interesting webcast. And in today's webcast, we're going to be talking about Ethereum and general crypto. Hashoshi, welcome. Awesome. Please Thanks for having me. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I, I do every day work with the Ethereum protocol, building dApps. And uh, I started my YouTube channel really with the main purpose and intent of teaching as many people as I can about this awesome technology, this awesome movement. And really just to give you the technical side of things in as simple terms as possible so you can make your own decisions about you know, what projects to support, what you like, what you don't like, and hopefully help you move the movement forward as well. Sounds really good. Sounds really good. Now, a uh, question. So when did you first get into crypto? Yeah, I actually, I, I was doing an interview this morning and that same question came up and it's, it's actually funny looking back on it. You know, when, when Bitcoin came to the fray, I was like just beginning high school. And when I read that Satoshi white paper at, in high school, I thought, wow, this is such a unique concept, you know, and, and I think when you're in high school too, and you're at that age, you start to then know how, like notice how the world works. And so I just thought it was such a, a vast and wonderful change to the way that things had been for so long. Uh, yeah. And so I, I really took that to heart. And then when I ended up going to college, that was about the time that, you know, Ethereum also was really starting to pick up steam. Um, and from there I started studying computer science, studying business. And I took that and I started working with Ethereum code on, you know, on my free time. Well, that's cool. And, so what year yeah. was that, if you don't mind me asking? Um, so I really I really started getting more deeply into Ethereum in like the 2015, 2016 time period. Um, okay. You know, I was following it. And then really when I it was when I, when I graduated college that I really took it to the next level uh, and I was able to do it for my full time job. So that's yeah. that's really what what took me uh, took me across the finish line in terms of what I knew I wanted to do. I was lucky enough to, to get a job that really supported my, my passion for, for yeah. crypto and for blockchain. So, yeah. I'm guessing you weren't really investing in it. You're more interested in the tech at the time, right? Yeah. And I mean, I honestly think that back, back then it was so much less about investing and it was so much more about how, how cool it was and, and like using it. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I use Bitcoin and I, you know, I traded and used it for stuff and you know, it's really, you know, it's easy to look back and be like, wow, if I had saved that, you know, that Bitcoin I used to buy a trading card, I probably would be much more wealthy than I am today. But, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I don't think anyone really realized what the value was going to be, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And especially, I know that when I was reading some forum posts from back in 2009, and people are saying that with a basic laptop, with basic specs, you could mine something like uh, 200 Bitcoins per week, which is absolutely crazy if you think about it, you know? Yeah, it is. I had a, I had a little, not for Bitcoin, you know, a little tiny, you know, tester mining setup for Ethereum with a next, you know, with a, a laptop. And it, after a while, it ended up just melting the thing. It was, it was such a weak laptop. There was no <laughs> chance, like not even a chance. Yeah. But I, I think that's what's really cool about it is that people that may not want to be a developer, maybe you could, you want to be a miner. You know, you can yeah. have a bunch of different varying levels of, of technical ability and still really make a difference in this in this movement and i love it so yeah that's that's definitely true so what do you actually like about blockchain i honestly think that blockchain and you know the technology and the the social aspect that comes off of that um it's so powerful because it's changing the way that business is done it's changing the way that people interact with each other share data and exchange value and i think that creating an infrastructure that takes what the internet was supposed to be a step further and make it a more enforceably open and distributed decentralized environment. That's yeah. what's so powerful about it. You know, you know, you have right now all these different applications and stru data structures and things that don't inherently connect with each other and everything's so split and fragmented. And I think, and I believe that blockchain and cryptocurrency is a way to bring all those things back together a little bit. Yeah, uh, and really give more responsibility and power back to all the users as a collective, and less so, um, you know, power users or the, the you know the controllers of a 
or the creators of a platform. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I'm also like, I, I'm a Microsoft database developer. Mm -hmm. I work on Microsoft SQL Server. And, you know, right. for me, blockchain is kind of like the next level of databases, right? Because yeah. it's not centralized. You know, it's like the complete opposite of what I'm used to working. So, yeah, it's a whole new yeah, way of, yeah. of, of dealing with data. And it makes you think about how much data should I actually have and store openly, right? In SQL, yeah. it, you get, in traditional databases, people get in this mindset like, okay, let's just, dump everything we can into that you never know when you're going to need it it's like the the database or the data equivalent of hoarding like in your house <laughs> yeah well i don't know man I've, I've worked in some companies i don't want to name them but uh, i've seen business logic in the database in stored yeah. procedures so imagine trying to uh, to debug that like thousands yeah. of lines of code in a stored procedure is just absolutely crazy yeah, i agree but yeah for agree. for the users for the for the viewers that are watching this um, stored procedures are actually like a line of code uh, within the database layer which uh, basically should return data or should um, load data in the database so depending on the use case but yeah having business logic is definitely not the way it should be at least not complex business logic agreed so yeah so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Ethereum now. So um, could you please talk a bit about proof of stake because we've you know, heard that that's gonna go to Ethereum pretty soon. So when, when are we gonna see that, you know? Or... Yeah, so I actually was, I'm, I'm research, doing some research right now. Um, there's a, a test net that was announced um, for Prism to do testing. I think it's called Gorly. Uh, and that's gonna really incorporate some of those preliminary features for the beacon chain, the proof of stake beacon chain. Uh, and I was also just trying to look into all the factors that are playing into this Ethereum roadmap going into like 2020 and beyond. Um, I, I'm of the opinion that we're going to see preliminary proof of stake functionality by mid 2019. That's my opinion. I don't know. But what I think we're going to see is we're going to see that Casper um, like finality system coming in. And, and when I say finality, I mean, um, you know, the proof of work blockchain is going to be around for a while, but it's going to feed into this, you know, other blockchain, this Ethereum 2.0, which is yeah. going to be what becomes the full proof of stake ecosystem. So it's kind of like a, it's like a migration, you know, it's going to take yeah. time for them to fully build out all the features and it's going to be piecemealed over time. So I don't think we're going to see like full proof of stake Ethereum going on and no proof of work, like no proof of work at all until like 2020. Right, I see. So That's the proof opinion. of stake functionality, is that going to be integrated in, say, my Ether wallet, for example? I think eventually. And that's one of the big topics that I think is not talked about enough. One of the main reasons why so many developers, including myself, are still so partial to Ethereum and still develop almost exclusively with Ethereum. I've, I've made a concerted effort to try other things and, and explore other platforms because I feel like I owe that to myself to, you know, be creative and do something else. But um, Ethereum has so many developer tools. They have so many different websites and platforms and wallets and things that all support decentralized applications and developers that build them. And when they change core functionality, like the virtual machine that does the computation execution of smart contracts, when they change the way consensus is reached, the way that gas and other things is calculated, that is going to change all those tools and those tools are going to have to also migrate to a new way of doing things. Right. So it's not as simple for Ethereum and the core development team to just say, okay, well, yeah, we know what we got to do. We're going to implement this update and then just have fun guys. They need to make sure that all of that stuff that they're doing is communicated to the other parties that really make the ecosystem relevant. And so yeah. that's a big thing to look out for in the next, you know, 12 to 24 months as these changes start to come. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds really good. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that down. So I look sure. forward to seeing that. Yeah, same. Now, uh, I look forward to it. A, a really interesting question now, which is related with uh, the fork that was supposed to happen recently. Mm -hmm. um, well, basically the Constantinople hard fork. So Ethereum have delayed it, right? But Apparently, some people mind anyway. Now, I actually didn't know about this. It was actually a community member that asked me to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit confused myself with this question, but maybe you'll be able to share some info on that. So mm -hmm. apparently, some people mind uh, with this fork, which actually did happen. So uh, what's going to happen to that chain? Because apparently it happened, 
but it didn't fully happen. Something like that. From this is my understanding from what yeah. this guy was telling me. So um, and also he's also asking um, about the Ethereum hard fork. So when it will happen, will it go to this rogue chain? Right. So I'll address those one by one. So the first thing, yes, there were a handful of miners that did uh, adopt that code, start to ran, start to run that hard fork for Constantinople, and then stayed on it. The assumption is that either those miners switched over and then didn't pay attention to the news and so didn't realize that they abandoned the fork. So they've since they, their stuff's been running on autopilot and they don't know. The other idea is that people are trying to show solidarity for Constantinople and said, just do it anyway. And they actually believe that, hey, this reentrancy, this vulnerability is not a problem. Um, it's such a small percentage of miners that I don't think it's that material. I do think that anytime you have a chain split of any of any size, though, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of irritating and concerning. But I think this is not something to be super worried about at the moment. If you start to see people ahead of the new fork start to adopt and move over to old code and then everyone gets confused and you start to have risk of a chain split, I think then that's when you get worried. But the Ethereum E community overall is very good about communication and so miners that are paying attention and like really trying to get on the latest they're gonna they're gonna know and and okay. i think overall we're okay right now um from what i understand the next push for constantinople is still set for february or end of february um okay. i don't I can't guarantee that it's going to be then and that it's going to, that they're not going to delay it again, but I would much rather having already had it delayed once. I'd much rather than make sure that everything is tested and do unit tests, like, um, you know, in full, full end to end testing of potential vulnerabilities on smart contracts that could be introduced before they release it. So right. it, I like it to be as close to perfect as it can be when they go to release it officially. So actually just a question on that. So from my understanding, from a hard fork, a hard fork, sorry, point of view, it should have basically split. Like we should have still had the Ethereum blockchain and create a new, a new blockchain, basically, right? So we should have two coins yeah. running together, like we've got Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. However, yeah. this was not supposed to be the case with Constantinople, apparently. So, how come we actually got another chain? This is the part that I'm not really clear about either. So, yeah. could you please um, share some info on that, just to kind of make it more clear? So so what happens in a hard fork is there is always there is always a, a divergence or a fork in in the two blockchains right yeah when you someone says there's an actual chain split it's when large like enough of a majority of of people do not move over from the old code to the new and then both chains continue to mine and then because what happens in a, in a successful hard fork is that the other chain is abandoned to the point where it becomes you know, it, it stops and then Redundant. everyone continues, right? So you have these like little branches off and then the other, like the new chain continues, right? Okay, so That's does it get, does it start mining from the uh, block where it was uh, forked basically? Does it continue right. mining so, from there on the new chain, right? So there's an, ado there's an adoption period and, and you know, there, every fork is different the way that they go about it. And honestly, every blockchain is different the way that they adopt a fork and what the rules are. Um, but the way that if you wanted to look at it like an actual fork in the road, basically, eventually that old set of rules, ideally, would hit a dead end. And this chain with the new rules would continue at a certain right. point. And it's like a, there's like a cutoff point. Um, so, I mean, the fact that there are two chains just means that there's enough, there are enough people using and mining with the new code that it's continuing to run and and because there's no central authority to say hey no this is not the legit blockchain rules that you're supposed to be on there's nothing stopping them from doing so um, and so when the DAO hack occurred in 2016 and we got ethereum classic versus ethereum that was because not everyone agreed with the idea that they wanted to roll back to the block where the hack occurred and then start again so okay. everyone who said, you know what, we're going to deal with the consequences of this hack and we're going to say it's okay and move on, that's Ethereum Classic. Because <laughs> they wanted to stay true to the idea that it's irreversible. Yeah. yeah Whereas yeah. a lot of people that are now on the Ethereum network today at that point were like, no, I want my coins back, right? 
And so, that, I mean, that's what, that's the, the interesting thing is, is that no matter what, if enough people on the blockchain decide, hey, I, I, I want to reverse transactions, that's also a viable option. Yeah. Um, it's not, I'm not saying it's the true decentralized division per se, but that, that is, it is a viable option. Yeah. No, no, thank you for that. It's actually a really good explanation because it makes it more clear now for anybody watching it as well. So yeah. I mean, it, it gets super, it gets super fishy and difficult because also, yeah. the, you know, the way that it's represented in, in the media is not always, it's not that it's not true. It's just, it's summarized. And so people are not really going into the semantics of how it's actually working behind the scenes because yeah. it can be a little long. Yeah, I can imagine. Thank you for that. Now, so for the next question, what's your opinion from both a developer's point of view and a user's point of view on Ethereum? Yeah, I think that's super, that's, that, that one can be answered super quick. As a developer, it's an opportunity. As a developer, it's a chance to take skills you already have and build something new because it's very easy to move as a traditional developer using JavaScript or C languages or other things like that and do app, build apps with Ethereum. And there are a lot of tools, a lot of some documentation. It's very developer friendly. As a user, I think Ethereum is confusing because users understand that Ethereum has all these decentralized applications. People like to use it, but there's also this token that was $1,300 and now it's a hundred and, and it, it gets very fishy for people like what to think of Ethereum. And then you have all the news about how Ethereum is not moving fast enough. And I'm critical of Ethereum too for not getting these core features out fast enough, but I also acknowledge it's really hard to do that, you know? So I think- Yeah, because it's not scalable at the moment, is it? Yeah. So it makes it, it makes it tougher because you've got, what well, you've got still got 15 transactions per block, on right? Average. Second? Yeah. Right, that's, that's on average, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. And, and look, the, the thing is that people need to understand, I'm critical of Ethereum as a developer because I know there are flaws and I know they're trying to fix them, but they aren't fixing them fast enough. However, I also understand that as a user, you look at that and you say, all these other blockchain networks are coming out with, you know, DPoS, proof of stake, they're scalable technically. Why, why can't we have that? Why, like, why, why is this taking so long? And the reason is, is because Ethereum has built this all kind of from scratch and they have a lot of users. They have a lot of external parties that rely on it. They have a lot of businesses that rely on it. So they can't have the luxury of saying, we're just going to have downtime and we're going to like, break everything and while we figure this out it has to be perfect and they have to build from what they already have so they don't break everything else whereas a platform that forked ethereum and built from scratch they had time to go in and break things and figure out how they wanted to manipulate it because they had a base to go off of so yeah. it's, it's a lot harder and time consuming more time consuming for them to do this so I, i'm i'm trying to be more understanding because i have on in, you know on twitter and other things in the past said you know hey too slow <laughs> you know but i'm trying <laughs> yeah, to be you, you built a reputation now as the ethereum dev who's on youtube you know i yeah. think you're quite unique actually i don't know if there are any other devs as far as i'm aware well ivan on tech is a tech guy um yeah. i think he does i think he does build with ethereum stuff like i do um yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't gotten the chance to talk with him or anything yet. I, I would like to do that sometime, but. Yeah, I actually chatted to him on Telegram. He actually joined the K-Dub's channel. Uh, oh, yeah. Channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where I got to see him. And people are asking like, uh, can you really prove you're uh, Ivan? Because I think you're, you're fake. You're not really him. And he actually posted a few photos of him in bed. So <laughs> it's like, it has to be him. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice to talk to him actually and maybe do like a proper... Um, for sure, conference, you know where we could share our opinions and stuff. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, as far as I'm aware, he um, he actually has his own company, like Blockchain Sweden, I believe, or something like that, in which he's also a consultant and he he does some development using Solidity, just yeah. like yours. So that's that's the that's the fun of it for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's awesome. But yeah, um, Ethereum for developers, an opportunity, but a challenging one. For users, it can be confusing, but also cool. So yeah. Definitely. Now, so what are you and other Ethereum devs doing to make it better and more attractive? Um, so that's actually one thing. When I say I'm an Ethereum developer, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm working on the protocol. I'm not, I'm not that, I like to say I'm not that smart because I'm self-deprecating. I think I, I'm not dumb, but I'm not like, a, I'm not like Vitalik or anything, right? 
So what I do as a developer that builds dApps is I want to make stuff that gets enterprises, users, like just in general, the general public to understand what the benefits of a decentralized application are to help them do make their business better with blockchain technology and make them, you know, Ethereum oriented businesses, right? Yeah. So my, my goal is education and adoption of what Ethereum has built for me. Um, you know, they've given me the tools to build stuff that people can use to make their business better and to have fun. So that's, that's my goal. Uh, and I think adoption and people with boots on the ground to build stuff, that's what Ethereum needs. So I like to think that I'm, I'm making a difference by doing that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really good. I think I think you're doing a good job, especially those videos in which you're explaining the different coins from a developer's point of view. I think those are really interesting because awesome. you can give Thank an insight from a different perspective, not just like from reading the white paper, like guys like me do, for example. We just yeah. go through the white paper, through the important parts, and we just like share that information and just say, we think this because of that. Or, But you're able to go into GitHub and actually look at the code and try to make someone yeah, I mean, of it, which is different. So. you know, it's, that's the thing. It's, it, you know, especially doing this job, I mean, going on YouTube and telling people about stuff, like I learned so much from people that go through and they drew a different conclusion than I did, you know, like sometimes I like, I miss something or I get a detail wrong and, and people in the community come and say, Hey, like great video. Just wanted to tell you this thing. And I love that. Cause that's how I learn faster. Cause I can, that way it scales. I can't spend 12 hours a day researching and learning about this stuff online. I have, a, you know, another job. So yeah. people helping me is great. Yeah. No, no, it's good. It's good. Definitely. Yeah. Keep, it, keep it up. Now uh, let's move on from Ethereum to other cryptocurrencies. And this is sure. a topic I'm really interested about. And I'm sure a lot of viewers will be. Um, what's your opinion on ontology and their consensus mechanism called VBFT? So the Byzantine fault tolerant, uh, Right. What what yeah. do you have to say about that that protocol, that consensus mechanism? Yeah. So I'm actually in the process right now of, of trying to dig deep into ontology for one of those Token Talk Tuesday videos. So um, that that's coming. Uh, I know that there's been some question marks about that and how it's going to work and whether it's truly unique from some of these other you know Byzantine fault tolerant solutions where they're staking and other things, um, you know, proof of stake oriented or delegated proof of stake. Um, it's definitely one of those ones that I think people need to sit down and really understand how it works, um, which I'm not going to claim to sit here and I'm not going to sit here and claim that I know how it works yet because I'm still working on the research. But yeah. I think the first step is if you're concerned about it to go on their, the ontology website or to go through that, the white or yellow paper that's been released about how it works and just yeah. start to read through it and see, especially how it compares to, some of the white papers out there for other consensus mechanisms of the same variety. Uh, I think if you'll see similarities and differences, be able to compare and contrast and find out what you need to look at in more detail, because you really only need to know the most about what makes it different and potentially how they may have improved or made it worse. Right. Um, Apparently they're quite yeah. similar to Neo from a coding yeah. perspective. Right. And I think that they're all, they've always been very parallel projects and the way that they approach things. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I will say that's one of my next tasks is I need to go and dig deep into that one, but I don't have a detailed opinion because I'm not a hundred percent sure how everything works yet, but yeah. it's coming. But you do know that they're very fast, right? I mean, you've tested the transactions. You've seen that they can, I mean, one block is yeah. one second pretty much, isn't it? Yes. They can, I think they can handle thousands of transactions. I'm not sure how many, but I know it's thousands. Uh, yeah, so it's I mean, pretty, it, that, fast. That's, that's the goal, man. You're, uh, we're seeing, you know, one second, half second block times coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, that's the goal, scale. Cool. That's it, that's it. Uh, now talking about ontology, so, I don't know if you're familiar with their node staking feature. So I've actually done two different demos on node staking, one from the uh, O wallet, which is Dontology's official wallet. And then I did another demo on O3's uh, mobile wallet, who recently enabled these node staking feature for Ontology. Now, so a lot of community members are actually concerned. I myself am not, but I will be asking you this question, your opinion from a developer's point of view uh, about them being a Ponzi scheme and possibly exit scamming with people's coins on the nodes because they own all seven consensus nodes, right? We've got the candidate nodes, which belong to the companies and we've got the consensus mm -hmm. nodes and we can only stake on those seven consensus nodes 
which uh, ontology actually own. What's your opinion on that? Could they potentially do it? Reading the information, they did say that if it gets blacklisted, right, if any of the nodes get blacklisted, um, the, the stakers will be receiving their ontology coins back to their wallets. But the big question is why would they get blacklisted if they own the nodes, right? I don't know, I mean, could it be because of an attack? What's your opinion from that point of view? They're going through the same problem that I think a lot of other projects are going through, and that's how can we meet the demands of security and even regulators? You know, some of these projects are unfortunately having to comply and, and worry about potential legal action because of, the, you know, the way that tokens have not yet had precedent, right? So I think they're struggling with that from the perspective, of how can we have control and how can we create an ecosystem that's fast, but also secure and that if something goes wrong, we can fix it. Um, so from that perspective, I understand, but I think that they, they made the mistake of putting themselves in a bad place optically. So people are now looking at this saying, how can we trust that our coins are safe and that we have a say if the company behind this owns the main power behind it, right? Do I like that idea? No. Do I think that their intention, do I think the intention is to steal coins and to exit scam? No. Is it possible technically? Like theoretically, is it possible? Yes. Like if, if, they, if for some reason, all the founders and the developers in of Ontology decided, yep, tomorrow we would like to scam everyone. Based on what I've seen, they theoretically could do it from a technical perspective. It would be a lot more difficult than people think though, because they would need to, they would need cooperation from the candidate nodes, I, I think. Um, oh, okay, right, that, right. That's my opinion. But, but, but as far as I'm aware, uh, they actually own more, I mean, they actually own the majority because they own those seven consensus nodes, meaning that they own the majority of the, of the network, right? This mm -hmm. is my understanding at least. Yeah. I don't know enough, but this is what I've read. And apparently because of that, they have the control. So that would be quite interesting to find out yeah. what could happen, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the same problem that you see, you know, other networks of, you know, similar structure, like, you know, Tron, for example, there are a lot of companies that own, like big companies own a large, like majority of the power in the network because they became uh, the candidates, you know, the delegates for the network, right? And you know, that, that's just a nat that's the natural progression of this type of consensus mechanism. They're going to have to figure out how to work around it. Yeah, and, and also make it decentralized, right? Because this is kind of like going against decentralization. They're centralizing the consensus nodes. Yeah. So it's like you're forced to, to it's stake an, on their own. Right now, it's an impossible trade-off. You can't have something that is super fast, but also fully decentralized. It just doesn't exist yet. So these, yeah. these companies and these projects are making sacrifices and compromises like how can we get as close to this right scale, but also not give up all decentralization? They're, they're, they are creating the ability for centralization to occur. That's just part of the game. It's gonna take time to figure out how to get around that. Yeah, no, that's really good. Thank you for that. And actually, before we move on to the next question, um, just about the, um, the ontology again, I just wanna cover a bit more on that aspect. Um, so we had the, we, we spoke about node stake and I wanted to talk about the upgradable smart contracts. Mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on that? I mean, do you see that as something beneficial or is it something negative? From my point of view, for example, I see it as something beneficial because if somebody, if a company deploys a smart contract which is not upgradable and it has a bug in it, then that's pretty much gone, right? That smart contract is finished. They need to deploy a brand new one, right? Mm -hmm. So what could happen to people's coins in that case? That's another question. But what's your, what's your take on this? Like, Yeah, I, honestly, I think it's a good idea from the perspective of operations. You know, like you said, a company wants to make an upgrade. They change their business logic, whatever. They have to make a modification to this contract, right? I think where it has to be governed very, very, very closely is like bait and switch attacks where you have a trusted DAP where a hacker or the developer decides to put in a contract that has a vulnerability and people don't have a way to check if something's changed. Yeah. Right. You know, this happens with software like phishing almost where you go to a website, it looks the same. It, it feels the same. They're stealing your stuff, right? They're stealing your credentials. That's a risk that 
is introduced by allowing smart contracts to be shifted. And so they have to make sure that any way, any opportunity for that is mitigated in some way. Um, yep. But I think operationally, definitely important, definitely necessary. And I hope that, I mean, I'd like to see how, how effective the, the solution to that problem is. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. And uh, yeah, let's see how things go because we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of progress nowadays. I mean, they've had a lot of partnerships as well as a project. I mean, I, I personally think they're doing quite good um, in terms of marketing, in terms of partnerships. They're really trying to attract like the DAP developers, but it seems like they're struggling for some reason. I don't know if it's the bear market. What's, what's your there take There just on aren't this? many of them. That's yeah. the problem. People yeah. think that there are like millions of DAP developers. There aren't. There's not oh, that okay. many. So that and explains it. And it's not even that there aren't many that can do it. It's just there aren't, there aren't many that are because it's not, we're not at peak adoption yet, you know? I think there are a lot of developers that aren't gonna, that aren't willing to bet their whole career on this right now because they, they have a stable job. They're not gonna be like, all right, well, this crypto market's a mess right now, but we're gonna still, you know, we're gonna bet on that. Yeah, you know, yeah. There are people like, like us that are passionate about it, that have always been passionate about it, that are willing to do that, but not everybody is and I understand that. Yeah, yeah. And from what I heard is like, if you change your um, job description or not even your job description, but like your professional uh, profile from, uh, I don't know, normal .NET developer, Java developer to blockchain developer, you automatically get spammed with a lot of requests from different recruiters yeah. asking yeah. you to come work. So it's like, wow, you know, it's like, it's really changing, isn't it? it Especially is. in 20, at the end of 2018, uh, sorry, at the end of 2017, that's when uh, a lot of these ICOs are just like crazy. They're looking for developers and it was just really hard to find them, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. very, very, you're right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in IT in general, I don't know how it is in the US, but in Europe, it's quite a struggle to actually find developers, especially in the UK. I mean, I live in Spain, so in Spain, it's not really that, there are not many jobs available for IT developers, but in, in the UK and in Germany, it's like, it's booming, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a struggle. For sure. So Yeah. Now, um, let's talk about this new protocol, well, it's not really new, actually, it's been talked about in early 2018, I believe, uh, Mimble Wimble, right? The yeah. Harry Potter spell. So this is the hot topic now. I've actually done a video on it uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm just curious, what's your take on that? And uh, can it make uh, Bitcoin more scalable in the future, more secure and private, let's say? Um, I don't know. I mean, well, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, if you're a Harry Potter fan, Mimble Wimble is like your dream because everything in there, top to bottom, is like Harry Potter references. But, you know, I think Mimble Wimble is a really fantastic implementation of, you know, encryption methodologies that are very common in practice yeah. that could be used in the, a Bitcoin type protocol to make transactions anonymous and to make transactions a little bit more efficient um, you know by the same hand you know when we saw the segregated witness or segwit implementation that was to reduce the overall size of transactions to fit into blocks right that was essentially the point i think mimble wimble also helps do that same thing to a, a greater scale uh, makes the end result is that it makes transactions and the volume or the the transacted value hidden but it also reduces the size of transactions so that you could theoretically fit more transactions into each block. I think oh, those okay. two things are what makes Mimblewimble so unique and cool. Um, the thing is, is that I think it's going to be a very, very, very tough road to get something like that implemented in Bitcoin because of how rigid the core developing development is for Bitcoin. I don't know how willing they would be to implement something so drastic to the way that it works in the short term right but so I, am i under yeah. am i right and understand that it actually compresses the transaction so that you can fit more transactions within the same size block right more or less i mean it's really what it's doing is it's taking out the necessity for a lot of the stuff that's in the transactions normally um you know if you go through on the github page for beam the, so there's there's two implementations of the Mimblewimble protocol. Um, so for those who may not be aware, Mimblewimble is like a, it's a protocol, it's a method. Um, and then Beam and Grin, two like smile type adjectives uh, or verbs, excuse me. Um, they've created pr uh, actual projects like blockchain networks that implement 
the protocol that is Mimblewimble. So I think those are good places to test it all out and show how it works, but they have a really good write up in their GitHub page about how the math works at a high level and what the results are for the blockchain. So that's a good place to, to check it out. Um, and I myself, I'll be making a video about the math part uh, shortly. Wow. That's good. That's good. Yeah, there was actually a guy who wrote a Medium article. Um, Sean, I believe, is his name, and he, he basically wrote that in a way to be made understood by twelve-year-olds. <laughs> it's like wow, yeah. in a really, really simple way. So I actually covered that article and I tried to break it down for people. But mm -hmm. it's it's like you are saying, you know, there, he went into the math part and he basically explained how to work with the uh, with the keys multiplied by the big number and you know the the money you're sending minus the money the person's receiving, right? Mm -hmm. And all that stuff. So it's basically the calculation that's happening in the transaction explained yeah. in a really simple way. So that's pretty cool. I think it's a novel idea. I think it's cool. Yeah. Um, and it's based off of a very tried and true uh, encryption methodology, elliptic curve. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't guarantee it's ever going to make its way to the Bitcoin network, but if it does, I will be very impressed if they can get that done. Wow. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it's not easy. Not easy to implement because it, it would be it would for sure be a, a significant hard fork, probably too. So, right. Wow. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now let's talk about Bitcoin SV, right? So yeah. it's not the hot topic right now. It was some time ago. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what's your opinion on that, by the way? Um, I think the name right up at, up front, Bitcoin SV stands for Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision. That kind of bothers me right up front <laughs> because here's the thing. And this is my opinion. This is not, again, this is not some sort of like fact everyone else is wrong thing. But I think anyone who's claiming to be Satoshi, anyone who's claiming that this is Satoshi's vision, I know his vision is literally as far away from Satoshi's vision as you can be. Because the whole entire point of releasing Bitcoin to the world, never showing his, her, or their identity, was Satoshi's way of saying, this is a gift to everyone, for everyone to use, and everyone to have a say, not me. It's not my job to be the leader. It's not my job to tell you what this is supposed to be like. Here's the base thing. You guys figure it out. This is a, an open democracy, right? And so for you to say, hey, this is Satoshi's vision. Love it. That's the opposite of Satoshi's vision because he would never tell, he, she, it would never tell you what his, her, or their vision is and make you do it ever. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my, that's my opinion because I think the whole symbolism of Bitcoin is that, hey, this is yours. This is everyone's. And I'm not God. I'm not the owner. I didn't, I'm not the creator for you to look at me and ask questions. I'm stepping back. Um, yeah. So I think from that particular side of things, anyone who claims that, that this is Satoshi's vision, I think is just kind of barking up the wrong tree. Um, <laughs> that's my opinion. Um, yeah. Look, the, the whole idea behind Bitcoin SV though is to, is to solve scalability by increasing block size exponentially okay. in a nutshell. And that's all well and good, but block size alone is not enough because changing one variable and not changing anything else can cause other problems. Um, you know, blocks become more difficult to verify going backwards um, yeah. overall. I mean, the process of hashing, yeah, the fingerprint of the block is going to be the same length and you can go back and verify if blocks have changed and all that sort of thing. All that's retained, but it takes more time to go back and verify again. Um, it's, it's, it, there, it introduces other issues just by reduce, or increasing block size. I don't know that that's the grand solution to Bitcoin scaling. So I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I'm not saying it's not a solution, but it's not the yeah. solution. I wonder when Bitcoin will be implemented, the Lightning node, for example, will that also get uh, migrated across to Bitcoin SV or would it be something totally separate and it could never happen on Bitcoin SV? Hard to say. It's very hard to say. Uh, I, I, I think that a combination of things on the Bitcoin network are going to help with scale. I think layer two solutions like Lightning Networks, we have private payment channels that change the state 
only once instead of like 50 times. I think that's always beneficial. So I think if you add lightning and you increase block size marginally and you improve or optimize the size of transactions a little bit more. So that's like three things you've added. Yeah. All those things in like a compound effort make Bitcoin more scalable, but you know, it's, it's a complex thing to do. It's not, it's not easy. It's taking time to build and it will continue to. So. Or, or they may get on the Mimble Wimble protocol, you know, you never know. Yeah. I mean, look, that's the thing, you know, if <laughs> all these things could be implemented, it's, it's an intricate situation though, because you do something that has adverse effects. It can cause a, you know, if, if, for if Bitcoin were to go into fully something fully unstable, it would be a detrimental to the entire crypto market. And we don't want that yeah, right now. That's just, now is not the time for that. No, 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 that's true. If it was like 100 K, then it would be different, but you don't want I mean, to if, look, if there was, if there was more, if there was more positivity no out there and there was more backing across the board. Okay. But the, the reality is, is that Bitcoin is always going to be the, it's got to be the rock. It's got to be stable for people to believe and understand like this stuff still works. Um, yeah. You know, Bitcoin didn't exist for 10 years without a real problem and protocol for no reason. It's because it was built well. The people believe in it. People who use it believe in it. That's why there were no problems, right? And they aren't introducing any extra complexity like Ethereum did. And that's what caused the DAO hack, right? So they, they're very, the core developers are very careful about what they bring to the table so that they don't break it. And I respect that for sure. Well, no, no, very good explanation. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thanks so for these now, awesome questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just tried to put them together, you know, and get them from the community and, you know, make it make it more interesting, basically. That's what yeah. I tried to do. Awesome. Now, final question before we wrap this up. Sure. What do you think will get us out of the bear market? I know not many people know the answer to this question. Maybe nobody knows the answer to this question, or maybe only a select few which are in the top ranks, you know, let's say the elite. The elite, which which nobody knows who they could be, uh, what's your take on this, and what do you think we need, you know, to, to get out of this bear market? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't talk about token price a lot because I don't think I have, it's, I don't think it's my place. Like I, I talk about the tech and I talk about what you need to know so that you can decide if the token price is fair. However, I think in terms of the overall, the whole overall market, you know, the capitalization, the amount of money that's here, the amount of people that use it, what we need is three things. We need the people in crypto to stop fighting with each other and stop hating each other and making fools of themselves. Right. 100%. What, what if, if I'm someone on the outside and I see only these people with these huge personalities fighting with each other and saying, you suck because you like this project, right? You should be investigated by the sec, right? <laughs> what is that? What does that say to them? It says that we don't have, we're not organized. We're not, on the same, we're not pushing towards the vision. We're fighting with each other, right? Yeah. That's first. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that everyone that's building things, that's promising things, needs to deliver on those promises. Yeah. Like no more empty promises, and, and we can't have another ICO thing where it's like, give me ten million dollars and I will deliver you nothing, right? It's, don't give us money. We're gonna get heads down, and we're gonna take. We're gonna make every cent that you've already given us worth it, and we're going to deliver. And then I think third is just as many people as, as, they, as possible need to get out there and just educate and share and share passion. Um, that's why I started this channel so that I could, you know, scale up talking to people and having conversations with people because I can't be everywhere. Um, at least this is a place where I can chat with people, talk to people and, you know, do these types of things with, with other crypto enthusiasts as well that serve as video records for others that may get into it later that want to learn what's happened in the past right so yeah those are the three things that'll get us out of the bear market alone it may not take it may not be tomorrow or next month or even in 2019 necessarily but over time that's what will solve it yeah 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 in my no, opinion you know there were a lot of jokes on uh, this is going to the moon that's going to the moon and i am still seeing that i mean it's like like you were saying yourself i've got these little groups of people mm -hmm. like in different projects which are just like my project is going to the moon. Yours is rubbish. Then you go to another group, they say exactly the same. Yeah. It's like the same thing repeating itself. You know, it's like, come on, we're supposed to be, if you're investing, you're supposed to be distributing your investment. Yeah. I, I think, 
Yeah, I agree, man. I agree with you fully. And I think yeah. every failure, every failure and every scam, every, and every good thing is a way for everyone collectively to learn and improve. Like if, yeah. if there's a delegated proof of stake failure, it's gonna, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be like, Oh yeah, I'm happy. People lost their coins. Right. I'm not, not saying that, yeah. but the amount of stuff that can be learned from that type of thing, it's huge. Cause you can bet that, you know, despite the loss, despite the difficulty, other projects that have proof of stake and that project that may have been, you know, had that failure, they're going to change. They're going to fix, they're going to work on it and they're going to learn a lesson. And that's how technology works. Always has, always will. That's how people are. You yeah. don't learn. You don't learn when everything's perfect. You learn when stuff breaks. That's that's the way it is. No, that's true. So last thing, when do you call it? Which year, from your opinion? I know it's a wild guess, but when when do you think? Yeah. If you had to place a bet on it, when would you bet that we're gonna see a bull run again? I think it'd be catalyzed by successful implementation of Ethereum features and some other big name projects hitting, hitting targets and meet, reaching milestones. Optimistically, end of this year, like end, very end. I think more conservatively, 2020, mid 2020. I don't know that it's not going to, like I said, it's not going to be this like easy thing. And I don't think anyone can predict it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm grasping at straws like everybody else is, but of course, um, you know, based on just my, my gut feeling end of the year, we might see an upturn, but it's not going to be like 2017 where it's like a thousand to 10,000 to 20,000 in, in three months. It's going to be a, we're going to start to see things stop going sideways up and down. It's going to be more up. That's my opinion, but that's not even about price. It's about sentiment and belief you know, I like, cause I don't even token price is a whole nother beast that I don't know if you can ever predict. So I'm yeah. never going to say, Hey, bye, bye, bye. Cause no, no, never, yeah. never. It's just not, I don't give Doesn't financial apply. advice. You don't, no one does. Yeah. At least yeah. no one should. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can show people the graphs, the historical graphs on coin market yeah. cap. Like I do that sometimes in my project reviews, mm -hmm. uh, just to give them an idea. Of course they can do their own research. They can check them too. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's as simple as that. Nobody yeah. can know for sure, right? I agree. Yeah. yeah, I think not even about price, but positive vibes and and like real like progress. Yeah, we'll start to see that at the end of this year is it is my optimistic, you know, good vibes opinion. Definitely, definitely. Well, very very good interview, um, guys. Thank you very very much for watching. Uh, if you have any sort of questions, any sort of doubts, just drop a comment below. Please hit the like, send the subscribe button, and also check out Hashoshi's channel. Uh, we're going to be posting it in the description below, so you can just awesome. click directly to it and hit the subscribe button there too. Uh, and yeah, I hope I'm going to be doing more uh, webcasts with Hashoshi and probably other YouTubers, you know, to basically discuss the news that come out, anything new, any any progress on projects maybe at some point. And uh, yeah, that should be pretty cool. And we can yeah, keep thanks. up the news. Thank you very much for, for, for coming, yeah. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, everybody that's watching, just know that, you know, whether you're a developer, just a fan, someone who likes crypto, you can make a huge difference, you know, educate others, be kind to one another. And heck, if you want to get into development, there are a lot of ways to do it and it's not as hard as it seems. So, uh, definitely know that that's an option always. Uh, yeah. Cheers guys. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye.